So thanks for having me. Um, I presented, uh, let's say, a related topic at a different uh, Py PyData meetup. Uh, and I actually don't want to talk about the same thing, so I'm talking about a different thing now. So that's indeed about Django and gRPC and how we uh, use that for automated visual inspection. Maybe first a slide about me. So I was already introduced. I'm a system architect. I worked for, uh, I think, over nine years already at ProDev Technologies. I've worked uh, in the beginning more as a software architect on our industrial automation platform. So ProDev is a uh, company that manufactures, designs and manufactures electronics, and we also automate that manufacturing. So I worked a lot with robotic automation, basically. Um, but more recently, I'm working on all kinds of AI and machine learning systems, and I'm also the competence owner of that to share the knowledge basically to people who do not know about AI and ML yet, or um, yeah, some experts just to sit together and uh, review interesting papers. Uh, yeah, and I'm also a drummer, and I like hiking, just some other hobbies. But that's not what I'm here to talk about. I'm here to talk about uh, Python and how we use uh, Django and gRPC. So I'll first introduce what is meant with automatic visual inspection. Uh, I also want to introduce the term MLOps, and I actually want to see uh, people who have, you have heard of the term, but are you actually using it? Are the people like applying MLOps in their company? I see some hands, like are you an ML engineer, for instance, then you're doing MLOps, right? Okay. Um, so I'll talk a bit about the Proto AI framework, which is a, a software framework we built to support this MLOps process. We'll give an introduction to Django and gRPC as well, and we'll end up uh, with a de demonstration. Uh, I was asked to record them, so we know that they will work. Uh, at the Pi meet, pay Data Meetup, I had to come back and uh, make it work. Uh, it did work in the end. It was an internet connection. But uh, now, if the movies work, it will uh, show you the demo. Um, and I also want to know who of you have been using Django, are using Django? Not very much. That's OK. That's good. And gRPC? Expect even less. Yeah, just a few hands. Yeah, because gRPC obviously is not something Python specific, right? It's something you can use. It's an interface, uh, and you can use it with a lot of other languages. But I'm just going to show you an example here. Okay, so give you a bit of a scope of what we mean with automatic visual inspection. So it's, these are some ProDrive products. ProDrive is an electronics company. We design and uh, manufacture all these kind of products. So here in uh, in the north of Eindhoven, in Son, actually, uh, we manufacture a lot of these. Um, it can be an automotive wall box to charge your electro, uh, electrical car to uh, an air uh, quality sensor. That's an automotive product, so it measures the quality in your car and outside. Um, linear actuator, so it's very broad uh, portfolio of all kind of let's say big products, let's say small sensors the size of this uh, clicker. Um, and well, we want to manufacture high quality products, so we would have to, we'll have to inspect them. And just to put down some requirements on this automated visual inspection, obviously we want to have no false negatives. We don't want to miss any defect, because if we miss it, our uh, customers receive broken products, we get a bad rep, bad rep, and we have to repair them, service is very expensive. Um, and ideally, we also uh, minimize the false positives because otherwise our uh, algorithms or this, this, this visual inspection algorithm is constantly triggering, hey, there's a defect, hey, there's a defect, and people will just start clicking yes, no, fine, it's pass, and, click, and start ignoring the inspection. Um, yeah, there's, there's no perfect world. We have to put some number on this. We put 0 0.1 false positive rate, 1%, uh, 0.1% is one in a 1,000, basically. Um, there are some more requirements. Uh, we manufacture thousands of different products. I just sh showed you a few, but we have many, many more, all kind of different variants. Ideally, we have no competences to add and create these new visual inspections, because yeah, creating them for all these products by engineers is also very expensive, so we don't want people in the factory to do that. Um, and we have different uh, setups in our factory with uh, camera setups close to a window in a, a space where there's almost no light, so we have to deal with all these environmental variations. And just some examples of these inspections, and there are some variants of this, but these are, let's say, the main classes. So we have our presence uh, detection. Is a component there or not? So you see this example. There's, uh, there's supposed to be five cables here. Here is a cable missing. And here you see a screw. A screw is missing here. Other category would be alignment. So again, the cable is here now, but, and here as well, but it's not fully in, so it's misaligned. And then we have this, let's say, third category we call damage. Can be anything. So you see a line of, uh, there's actually a glue line. So there's a part here, there's a defect, or you can have a text marking where something's missing. These are basically the classes we would have to deal with. Um, and I mentioned, yeah, we want to have uh, lighting invariance. It should be easy to train, no uh, computer vision uh, expertise required. Well, you might end up, hey, that's like a very good uh, problem statement for a deep learning problem. Well, let's try that, right? Let's go ahead. So you take your, your file storage. In our case, uh, a few years ago when we started this, all our images were on a network drive. Um, yeah, well, it should be good enough, right? Well, no. 
it, we don't want to start in supervised. We want to have a supervised problem, so we need to label them. So here you can see, indeed, these images have been marked. Green means pass, red means fail. OK, yeah, now, now we can start. So you give these images to your, to your data scientist or uh, your ML engineer, depending on uh, what that role is in that point. They make a nice mo uh, model in their Jupyter notebook. They use their favorite uh, library, PyTorch, Keras, whatever they like, maybe even a combination of two. Doesn't really matter. They make the perfect, <coughs> make the perfect model. And uh, they say, well, this is the performance. It meets the, the things I just said in the previous slides. And then there is border. Chug it over to the software engineer that has to integrate it in the camera setup. Well, yeah, it has no idea how to interpret the model. Do I need to, oh, I need to crop images. I need to uh, normalize them. Uh, do I need to monitor the model? Will it keep on performing and doing uh, its job over time? Well, these are all things that are not considered in general. And at some point, the model will fail. Uh, this is obviously something you have to deal with. Um, I normally also show, show a slide with many, many other frameworks that we can use, but I'll, I'll limit just to uh, the, the things I'm going to discuss now, Django and gRPC. But there is a process that can help you uh, solve this, and that's basically the MLOps process. And I guess when you're also a software developer, you're very well aware of the DevOps process, which is development and operations where you version your code, you add uh, versions to the releases, you have continuous integration with tests, unit tests, uh, different uh, production staging and production environment to test everything. Um, and with machine learning, it's actually the same, but just with some extra cycles. So you also add a machine learning cycle where you train your model, you uh, see uh, what architecture was used, what parameters, uh, where you give a version to your model. And for the data, it holds the same. You combine all the data, uh, you, you label your data, but you also register um, where it is from, who labeled it, um, and which data set you use to actually train the model. And when you have all these loops under control, then you know you have a robust machine learning application, because then you can guarantee, or well, not guarantee, but you can at least trace where the problem could be, and you can try to improve. And we had this example where, for instance, somebody did not uh, uh, mention which data was used, and we had a nice, very good performance model, which at some point drifted off. We wanted to improve it, but we had no idea where to start, because we didn't know what data was used. So again, we had to start from scratch. Um, how would you apply this to machine learning? Well. Uh, sorry, how would you apply MLOps to AVI? I just made a really simple overview. So your data, in this case, would be the images with the data. Uh, then you go to training, where you train your favorite deep learning model. You version and store that. And then you have your deployment setup, where uh, your camera setup could send the images to this model, for instance, as a web service. And then finally, you have a monitoring dashboard, where you also check if everything is performing in the, the way you expected it, for instance, with some alerts and thresholds. And you use that again to gather new data, label new data, and improve your model. Uh, do take care that you need a human in the loop, because if you uh, have a model that trains on its own input, you'll probably degrade over time, because the mistakes it will make, it will make more mistakes in the, in the end, and then train on that, and it becomes a one big mess. So do take uh, that into account. All right. Um, this is a big slide, and I just I don't want to detail out all these things that we have put in our ProDrive uh, AI framework, but basically is an open source, a collection of open source uh, tools, mostly Python tools, or almost all Python tools, I think, um, that we've, let's say, glued together. And this is our framework that we run on-premise. We can run on-premise or on, our, on a Kubernetes cluster in, uh, in Azure, for instance. That doesn't really matter. And um, basically, I want to focus on this part, which is really start with the data part. Because if your data is not well defined, not well structured, um, yeah, the other parts will become re really hard to, uh, to get under control. And so the last talk was about this part at the, the PyData meetup, about ML flow and cell and core, where you do the deployments. And now I'm going to talk about this part. Um, and you can see that the images from the production setup actually arrive in, in the data management component, where we have Django, and through a gRPC interface. So the camera setups can send their images over there, including potentially labels and other metadata. Um, so I saw some hands, um, and this is not a comprehensive overview of what Django does. I also am not a uh, maintainer of Django, just a user. Um, but it's indeed a web framework, and they uh, you call it themselves, they call it model template view, where you have, uh, let's say, models that define your database structure. Then you have template files where you can use all those, uh, the data fields of those models, and you can generate views. And the view could be a view for a user, but it could also be a view for another application, like an API. Uh, they've been in active development since uh, two of 2005, so it's already uh, also uh, been here for some time. And I mentioned templating, but also caching authentication, uh, very, a lot of built-in features. One I didn't even mention, you have a very nice, uh, let's say, 
functional type querying. So you can just stack these things together, also like pandas and polars, where you just combine uh, statements, and it's lazy execution. So also Django decides, okay, actually I'm going to do it in a different order and build the most efficient uh, SQL query for you. This is an example of the interface that you get for free. So that's their ad admin interface. Um, all the data models that you make, you can yeah, add here, change in and, and the way you want. You can add users even if you want. And that's how you can uh, at least get started on a really simple application and build on from there. It's not that this is just uh, a nice open source package. No, there's a lot of other big companies that actually use it, like uh, Insta, Mozilla. Atlassian Bit Bitbucket was uh, built with this, as far as I also could read on the, the Wikipedia. So it's, it's definitely used by a lot of bigger companies. And that's the, the great part. They have many, many plugins and extensibility. So I'm going to show you, indeed, the Django GRPC uh, plugin. And there are some variants with their uh, pros and cons. But I now selected this one just for this demo. But there are many other things out there as well. OK, but then. If we want to build an application here, we do need to have some data model for the automatic visual inspection. So I'm going to take this image as an example. So this is a, a, a reference image as a product. And uh, I'm going to build the data model up here in the center. So the first thing we'll start with, we have a product. That is basically uh, represented by this image. And a product could have one or more inspection views. You can have an inspection from the top, from the side, maybe inspection view view during different stages of the manufacturing process. And that's basically how we define it here. So we have a product, we have an inspection view. Um, we have one or more inspection views, basically. And that's how we define it here. And on this inspection view, uh, we define inspection tasks. And all these inspection tasks are these, let's say, rectangles over here. And each rectangle indicates a certain inspection that you would have to do on that location on that product. So we have an, uh, it's linked to the view, obviously. We have an, uh, a name. Uh, it's not shown here, but we should have a name. Oh, yeah, there's a name, and we have the, basically the definition of this rectangle in that image. Well, this is already a very nice setup to at least define all your inspections, right? We can define multiple products, multiple views on that product, and we can define multiple tasks on each view. Um, then the, the other side, we also want to gather, let's say, samples from production. This is just a reference sample, but we're, well, when we're producing, we're not just building one, we're building many, obviously. And uh, we're going to store them as well and link them to this data model. So we have an, we, I call it here an image. Um, and uh, basically, you can have many of them, and they're linked to this view. So each image is linked to a view. And on top of that, we also want to label this. So each of these same tasks that you see here can be labeled. So a label is a connection between an image uh, and the task, and then basically indicating if that's pass or fail. So it could be that this region there's a component missing, or here there's something misaligned. That depends on the task. This is at least a simple version of our data, of a data model. Uh, I say it's also simplified. It, our data model does look like this, but it's a little more, co more complex. But I just simplified it for, uh, for the demo here. Um, yeah, so indeed, the label is linked to all these images and indicates if they're pass or fail. Uh, then on to gRPC. So uh, gRPC indeed is not Python specific. Um, and its acronym is actually uh, a gRPC Remote Procedure Call. So it's a recursive acronym. The G is not officially Google, I think. It is, it is made by Google. But, um, and um, basically, what you can do is that you can connect different software microservices together. So they can allow, maybe you're familiar with uh, like REST interfaces. This is similar, but it's, in my uh, opinion, a bit more structured and well defined. Um, yeah, and there's some nice features like bidirectional streaming and cancellation and timeouts. Just some, so how actually would you define such an interface? And what they, uh, how do you do that? You, you have a, a protobuf file. It's a different language, although it's very easy to, to read and comprehend. You uh, basically say, we have this greeter service. It's an example of that they always use on their website. And the service has one ro remote procedure calls, uh, said, say hello. There's a request here and a reply. And these messages are also defined here. So. You put your name here, and I think the idea is that then the return message would be uh, hello and then your name. So just a really simple thing. But really nice is that with this definition, you can generate a service for almost any major language. So obviously Python I'm going to show here, but also C Sharp, Go, Java, and they have a client for Julia now, also very nice. So it's very uh, cross-domain. Uh, for instance, where we use in the factory, some of our setups in the factory run C Sharp, and there we built the C Sharp interface. And uh, let's say on our service, the data manager with Django, it's Python, and it all works perfectly together. And the, the really key here is you have a really well-defined interface. And I, th I think it's also possible with OpenAPI to generate this, but this is already part of the protocol, and this is just how it works. And it's also really fast, because it's a serialized binary format. All right, then moving on uh, to the demo. Um, 
So what do we actually want to do? We want to store the, uh, the definition of, of our inspection, like the data model I just showed you, what the inspection, where do we do the inspection. We want to store the sample, so data coming from production, and we want to use a GPC interface to actually uh, to do that. Um, so what we're going to do, I have it defined in four stages. Always first, we're going to start with our environment. Uh, I use poetry. I want to see, are there people who are using poetry? Yeah, and I can ask, are there people using pip? Then that's everybody, probably, because otherwise you can't use Python. But uh, there's also, there are a lot of environments. Actually, there's a talk now ongoing uh, uh, on Pixie, which is also very nice, a dependency management tool, and there are a few. We, we did use pipenv. I'm not sure if people also use pipenv. Not that many, okay. Yeah, we started with that, but at some point, let's say locking our packages, which is setting a cer certain version of the packages, took like an hour. <laughs> and with poetry, it was a few minutes. So yeah, for us, it, it was really clear to swap to that. But I'll show that. Then we'll set up a Django uh, project and an app. We're going to define our data models, uh, the, the GPC interface, and then hopefully send some images. All right, and I have a recording here. Let's see if it works. I think so, because I saw something. Yeah, so we start with the first statement. We make an git repository, git init. And we make, uh, uh, with poetry, also do an init, which will create our pyproject.toml file through uh, some interactive uh, prompting. So it asks me to uh, create a description. Um, it asks me to make some package. I'm not going to do that. So now we have a nice initial pyproject.toml uh, file, which describes our package. We're going into the poetry shell, which means we're now in this environment, basically. And we're going to add some dependencies. So installing Django, installing uh, gRPC, all those things we need. Um, and it writes it in a log file, so that's done. Then we also add some development dependencies. So these are only dependencies you'll need if you want to change this repository, not when you want to use it. And that's also there. And you can see now this is all added to the pyproject.toml file in a very nice way. Now, we'll start uh, our Django project with the Django admin uh, command. So we have a project called AVI site. And in that uh, directory, we create a Django app. So each Django site can have multiple apps. And then you end up with this structure. So you see the, the AVI app over here with all its default files, and you see the site over here. So the site is really the generic thing of configuration of Django, uh, and the site is really the specific data models and admin interface and views of that specific app. And as I said, you can have multiple, obviously, uh, in the same Django site. Well, look, looking at some of the code, and th the first step is to actually define your data models. And I've, what you can see here, I've defined um, the product which is really simple, right? It's just uh, a char field with name and a text field description. Uh, the thing I did add here is a unique is true, which means you cannot have a product with the same name. That's just uh, an example, but you can add that to more fields if you would, would like that. And for instance, the description is blank, which means you, you don't have to fill it in. If there is no uh, blank or null classifier or uh, parameter in your field, it means you have to provide it, otherwise you cannot create that object. And then we have the view here as well. So same name and description. In this case, uh, the name is not unique, but something else will be unique. Um, it's linked to the product. There's a foreign key, right? So there's a relationship between these two. And it has a reference image, which is an image field. And that's the, basically that image without the rectangles. That's just uh, the image of the, the product. And we added this. So we can have this meta class where we define a more complex constraint. And what this actually does, we want to have a unique inspection view name per product because it would not make sense if you have a top view for a product and then again have a top view for a product. And I can't put that here, right? Because there can be a top view for product A, but there can also be a top view for product B. So if I would put that unique here, it would not allow me to create top view for product B. So you have to make that in a more uh, complex constraint. Uh, yeah, and you can provide the string functions, which are really nice if you view them in the admin interface later. Uh, and then we have the inspection task. Well, similar, and we have again a name. Uh, here it is linked to the inspection view instead of the products, because you can have, this is one too many, one product too many inspection views, and again, uh, one inspection view too many tasks. Um, so that's, again, there's our foreign key here, and then we have our uh, fields that describe the rectangle, so x min, y min, width and height, and they're all positive integer fields, and some help text, which really helps users in the admin interface to describe what it is, this is. And we added something extra here, which is clean, and with this method, uh, this is something that Django can call. Um, it already checks if you cannot add negative numbers now. That's already not possible in, in the admin <coughs> interface. But there's something more we need to check, because you can now, if you don't have this clean function, you could create a rectangle that goes outside of your image, which doesn't make sense. So what we basically do here, uh, we check if, um, if the rectangle goes outside in the width or in the height, and if that is the case, we'll throw a validation error, which will be shown uh, to the user. 
Then, OK, those are our data models. And then we will define the admin interface. Well, normally, you could also only do the bottom part, where you just say uh, to, the, to Django, basically, yes, generate a, uh, an admin page for this data model. And I added some more that I didn't show. There's also label and image here, but they're similar to the ones I just showed you. Uh, but we want, you can also customize them. So you can create this custom uh, inspection view admin if you uh, basically inherit from this model admin uh, part from Django. And you can add more things. You have to say, ah, it's for this model. We have some read-only fields. We want to uh, display these fields in a list. We have the list view of all the objects. And um, yeah, if you, the, the, the name of the object will be a link. You can click it, and you can go to its details. And this is basically how you could uh, provide it. This render reference image and this render image, these are custom methods we put on our uh, data classes or data models um, so that we can actually view the image in the admin interface, because otherwise it just shows you a link. And you can click it, and it goes to another tab, but now we can view it in the same page. So and here, you again, can see the structure, right? So we have uh, the admin that we're showing now and the one before. That was the uh, models.py. So let's see how that would work. So we're going to create them. I put uh, the edge next to it so you can actually see what's going on. Uh, first thing to be note, make sure you're in your environment, because otherwise it wouldn't recognize Django. So that's the poetry shell that I did before. Um, and we're going to run the manage.py command from Django with the command make migrations. And it will make the first SQL migrations to create the database. And when we actually call migrate, it will create that database. And you see this SQLite. So by default, it uses uh, SQLite to, um, yeah, to store its data. We have to create a super user, because otherwise we cannot log in into the admin interface. So I'll put it here as well. Um, and then we're going to run it. And it's basically going to run as a local server. So you see it here. And you can click this link and go here. So I have to log in now with the super user I just created. And boom, there you have your admin interface. And you see it's, uh, all the models are over here. Uh, well, I'm going to add actually a product. So let's say we add a test product. And we want to add an inspection view um, onto that product. So we have top view. We add it. We add an image. And we save it. Well, you see a nice inspection image of our product. You can even see it in the list view now if you want. And I zoomed in, so it's really tiny now. But this is just to, so you can read it. Uh, we're going to add an, uh, a task, so the presence of screw1. Um, again, link it to the view now. Add in some coordinates. 2,000 is a bit much, but you can see, yeah, oh, it's uh, indeed larger. Uh, this should be uh, larger than the width, not the height, obviously. <laughs> you can fix it, save it, boom. There it is, so it's saved now. Uh, we can add more. We could add uh, an actual image that would be captured from production. So this image is actually similar to the one you just saw, but it's a different one. And this actually has a defect. There's all kind of arrows on that one. So here, actually, you see the screw is missing. So we could already add a label now. And let's do that. So we select that image and that task. We only have one, so now it's easy. And we say, no, the result is false. This is a failure, and we save it. It's just a really simple example, right? Obviously, people are not going to do it like this. But this could be your back end. You could make really nice uh, interfaces on top of this, uh, maybe using Solara to create a really nice interface, right? And then the users can actually use it in the factory. But that's uh, yeah, a simple way to get started. But then about the G to the GRPC part, because I only mentioned uh, the Django part for now. But yeah, why do you, how do you then create this GRPC interface? Again, we need to start with uh, this uh, proto file that defines our interface. So now it's not the same as the greeter client. Now we actually uh, put something uh, <laughs> that makes sense in there. So um, yeah, we have a service called image data. And there's one called, called uh, store image. And uh, again, we have a request and a response. In this case, the request would be. Uh, a uint 64 for an inspection view. This would be the private key of your inspection, uh, sorry, the primary key of your inspection view. And then the bytes, the, this is the actual image. That's your payload. And what, what, what this service will then return is basically the ID of this stored object. So again, the primary key. All right, but then we need to, how, how do we convert this to Python code? Well, there's a package called gRPC IO tools. So normally you need gRPC to actually create the service, and gRPC IO or sorry, to use it, and gRPC IO tools builds the Python service from this protobuf code. And um, this is not that generated protobuf code. I can also show you that. But this is basically how you would use it. So now we're in services.py. And with this piece of Python code, we can use this interface that is generated in the back. Um, and well, if a request comes in, we have to do something in the service, right? So what we do here, this request comes in. We actually first check, does this view ID that you give, does it actually exist? Because otherwise, it doesn't make sense, right? So we check 
if that one exists. If not, we abort, and the client actually receives an error message. If it does, we'll create an image. We'll, add, uh, we'll link to this inspection view. We'll add the payload, the bytes of the image. We'll save it. And uh, we'll, after saving, actually generates the primary key, and we can use it in the response. That's a really simple implementation. Um, all right. And don't forget to add the GPC server also to the, uh, the settings. Otherwise, Django doesn't know you've created this method there. Um, and what I'm going to do, I have this script where I connect to uh, the server that started, and I will just send some random images, and I'll show you basically in the demo what that will look like. If it works. Yeah, so now the, the service is not generated. This is a protobuf file, so I'm going to use that uh, gpc uh, io tools command, really long command, to generate it. Now you have these three files, which actually contain your service, and now you see also that they are recognized here. So now this service, uh, yeah, and you see indeed the, this, this hook. You need to m put that in your settings, and then Django basically knows, ah, you've created the GPC service, and I need to, uh, when you turn it on, I need to send the request over there. Um, so let's run the server again. So we're first going to run the normal, uh, let's say, HTTP server. We can see what's going on. So yeah, it still works. We have uh, a test product. We have uh, a production uh, view. In this case, it's a blue image. It doesn't really matter. It's just a generated one. And we have no images yet. OK, well, let's see if we can put them in with our GPC service. So we're going to also start the GPC server, the GPC server. So you do manage GPC server. Now it's running on this port. Same port as here, right? Localhost 551. Um, so let's run this Python script and see what happens, right? Because this is the client side. And I added it the tiki dm so you can see the progress well, it goes really fast and boom refresh the page and there you have all your in this case randomly generated images and you can see there's a timestamp so we added all kind well that's just one type of metadata but really in in production add way more right where is it captured what's the camera setup um, if you make a label who labeled it all those things you need to do yeah so you can open the view the view is linked to this uh, this same uh, image in the case is the blue image again but yes this is the example all right, so what would be the next steps, right? Um, for future considerations, we didn't talk about deployment, so you have to think about hosting a database somewhere, storing the files. Now it's just stored on the local Django instance. We don't have any tests yet. There is a nice test part in Django. I didn't have time to show that, but it's also there. Um, and as I mentioned, we need to have way more validation, because now you can send an image, a sample image, for instance, that's way bigger than your product view. That actually happened because they changed the camera setup at some point. So add more validation there, but also log way more things. What's the, as I mentioned, right? What's the, the shutter speed of your camera? All those things you need to know for reproducibility. Uh, authentication should be added as well. Now uh, you have this default Django thing, but we want to connect it to our uh, Active Directory, for instance. Uh, and a labeling interface would be really nice. Just going through these tables is definitely not something that's workable in production. But again, it could be used as a backend, right? So some key takeaways. Um, and this is basically really the point, right? This is just an example, but it, it's really clear that if you want to do machine learning, first think about your data and try to structure it in a way. So um, think, indeed, can I create a model of, uh, of my problem and store that, especially if it's a generic one? And um, basically, you need to think how your data is stored, not. Uh, sorry, you need to think uh, how it should be stored, and how, not how it is stored, because people just think this is the way it is, and this is how we need to continue. But that's, that's obviously not the way you need to go. Um, yeah, structure your data and storage. Where does the data come from? I mentioned that already. Uh, you can standardize the format of ingress. So I use the GPC service in that case. But a uh, really important thing also to do after that, if you have all these images and data collected, combine it into a data set, uh, so that if you start training, you exactly know what you've trained on. And finally, I mentioned that already, we made a really simple labeling interface. No time to show it here, but this is an example where you can click basically through these regions and click pass or fail, and that's how we could uh, label our inspection tasks. I think that was my final slide. So according to that clock, I'm on time, but uh, maybe to your clock not. So thank you. <laughs> not sure if there are any questions. I got one. I'm sitting next to you. Sure. Okay. <laughs> So, so Thomas, great yep. talk. A um, uh, lot of information, very dense, right? So, so thank you for speaking quickly. So uh, uh, one of the questions that comes to mind is like, when you have all of these different products, right? You're, 
you have to destroy your products to train your models. Can you talk a little bit about, yep. uh, do I, you have to always break stuff to retrain yep. it, or how do you deal with that? Maybe yep. it's out of scope, but oh, no. that's an expensive operation when you're building thousands of these things, yes. I guess. Yes, yeah, sometimes hundreds of thousands even. No, this is a very uh, big problem. It really depends on how you would solve it in machine learning, right? I didn't mention that now, but we currently have a lot of binary classification models in uh, production, which means you, need, you do need a lot of images of bad products, which might mean you need to break them yourself, uh, you need to pull out a cable, take a picture, put it in the wrong order, take a picture, make a scratch, take a picture, oh, now the product is broken, yeah. So that's indeed very expensive. Um, we might have, we've done that for some of our high volume products, because there we know it pays off, but we also have lower volume products. And then we're actually not solving it with traditional binary classification, no, we want to use anomaly detection. So we only need images of, let's say, the good products, and from that we're just going to detect something is wrong. We lose that we know what is wrong, but we at least know something is not okay. And we can already get started with this. Just collect images of good products, and you can train these models. And there's a lot of libraries. I think Anomalip was also shown at some of the PyData data meetups that you can use for this. So you really only train on the good data, and that should be enough. That's also our way forward. So we still need to collect this data, and the labeling is only relevant for when we actually find defects, so we can use them for verification. I guess people want bitter balls, or there's still a question. Yeah, thank you for the talk. Um, I think REST is still way more used than gRPC. What, what made you decide to like, switch to gRPC? Yeah, so one of the key things is the, the really strict, well-known defini well definition with protobuf, uh, as I showed it here. I think that's a really nice feature. Uh, it is very fast, and we use it primarily internally in our company in a lot of different places. So we can generate the interfaces. We don't need to tell them, oh yeah, we changed this interface, so you now have to actually change this parameter name. No, we just release a new version of our protobuf file, which is also in a package. So we put this for C-sharp, we put it in the NuGet package. For Python, we put it in a pip, uh, pip, Python package, and basically that's how you can use it. So we just tell people, hey, you can, can now get our new version, and you can make them backwards compatible, because you can add fields, and <clears throat> gRPC still works with, let's say, if you have a, an older version of that message, as long as your servers can deal with that. But that should, fine, should be fine. You can just add fields. And there's a way of doing backwards compatibility. So backwards compatibility is one, a nice uh, interface description, and it's really fast, because it's binary. So also for a lot of messages, it will, be, it will pay off in the end, because it's faster than REST. Thanks, Thomas, for yep. giving us the importance of collecting data and labeling it correctly. So I would like to give a huge round of applause to Thomas again. For <laughs>